Okay, so uh, does anybody have any questions in the room to start with? Yes, Keely. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the, my question is for uh, Rhiannon. Um, do you think that the De Clare sisters were sort of uniquely positioned to have these sort of avenues to legal redress that perhaps other women wouldn't have had just sort of by nature, sort of fortune or their relationship with the king? rather than, you know, is it something that other women would have been able to have accessed as easily, or is it something that's a bit more unique to them? Thank you. Um, so they probably have better personal access to the king in that um, they could probably enter into correspondence with him, but I don't think that necessarily helps them that much um, in this period. But what we do see that is um, somewhat accessible to all women. So um, everyone could petition um, with a private petition. And we think that that was fairly accessible to all freemen. Um, and essentially the only cost involved was to um, draft your petition in Latin, which was fairly cheap, we think. Um, so really there is this direct conduit between ruler and ruled. I don't think it necessarily helps everyone. Um, and we can see very often um, uh, in the petitions of uh, Special Collections 8 in the National Archives that very often they are just sort of dismissed as, you know, you, you need to do this uh, at common law or the council can sort this out, the king does not want to deal with this. So th there are definitely um, some routes that are accessible to all women, um, whether or not it helped them in this period when um, the authorities pretty much just ignored um, convention remains to be seen, however. But thank you for the question. Thank you very much to you both. And I'm afraid it's another question for Rhiannon on a similar theme. You referred to Eleanor de Clare and sort of her taking on a quasi queenly role with regard to intercession. And I'm wondering if you could say a bit more about the, the language, the rhetoric surrounding that, and perhaps particularly how she's addressed when people seek her help. Well, this is um, an, an annoyance that I had recently was um, I've tried to go to the National Archives a few times to have a look at this letter in person, but unfortunately, it's always been, it's always been out with uh, a member of staff. So I've not quite um, managed to get my eye in um, with this letter quite yet. But I do think it's interesting that um, Joan has obviously I don't think we actually have the letter from Joan to Eleanor. Um, so the letter um, that we do have is um, from ancient correspondence of the Chancery and Exchequer, and that is um, Eleanor writing a letter to Walter of Norwich, who was the treasurer. So she's essentially just asking for a little bit of extra cash. Um, to be put towards Joan while she's in the Tower of London. So unfortunately, we can't really get a sense of um, how Joan might have addressed her. But I think it's fair to say that, you know, there was probably this community of women at court who perhaps recognised that something really quite wrong was going on in the background and felt perhaps this sense of solidarity towards each other. But unfortunately, we can't really see the other side of it. So I'm afraid I'm limited with what I can say on that one. Um, I've got a question for Jamie um, about the, so I was, I was really struck by just how sort of vitriolic the language was um it's amazing like I wrote you know the, uh, a man more a man more meet to be a captain of evil evil minded persons than to be a governor of a town sort of sounds more like religious polemic than a um 
been a sort of legal record. And I was just wondering what we know of sort of the religion of Eka and, and that dimension of the dispute or whether, you know, it could be a one word answer and that could be no. Um, but how much evidence there survives of that? Um, um, well, I guess, well, firstly, um, so Ralph Ellicott was, quite, was involved in quite a lot of disputes with the church. It was like, because um, it was a, the archiepiscopal manner. So the archbishops of York um, had deer parks, which he was always poaching in. And there's a parallel case at the exact time this is going on, where apparently out of his malice and cruelty, he's hunting all of Edward Lee's deer to destruction. But more on religion itself, the thing that when I said that the, uh, the, the agreement fell through, it was because uh, by the time it had been signed, like the, the pilgrimage of grace had kicked out and Beverly was heavily involved, which was kind of a religious conservative or Catholic or whatever, call it religious uprising, and kind of defense of local custom against centralization by the central government. And uh, a lot of the townspeople kind of they tried to get Ellica on side again as a, a rebel leader. So, and you see all the same name popping up, like he goes around to Sanderson's house for breakfast and they're trying to convince him. And then Richard, um, sorry there, Richard Wilson, who stands on the bench and is the one talking about procuring grudge. He, uh, he's the one who announces the rebellion and they're all ringing the common bell and it's the same thing. So I guess he's a kind of, as a, I guess as a kind of local magnate, he's kind of a, a sort of conservative religious kind of figurehead, I guess, in some ways. And um, yeah, that's how it comes out of it. Sorry, <laughs> I also have a question for, for Jamie, if that's all right, which is another one about the broader context of this dispute and, and, and to a certain extent, this representativeness, which is um, how much is the, the sort of, I suppose, the Crown's interest in this? And I'm especially thinking about Cromwell, who you mentioned was a sort of one of the figures that was petitioned to about this at one point as, alongside Star Chamber, which is the, really the Chancellor's domain by this point. How much was their interest in this influenced by their concern about what's going on in Yorkshire generally in this period? I know this is just before the Pilgrimage of Grace, but is, is, is that anything to do with the context here or are there enough cases like this elsewhere that you think that this is a more general phenomenon rather than a regional concern? I'm not, I'm not sure about contemporary cases in Yorkshire. Um, because I've kind of done a sort of different case studies over time. It's, it's, it's quite representative in, yeah, over time, like the, the same sort of language is used in different kinds of parliamentary elections and um, civic elections, the election of sheriffs in London, which became um, in the 1680s, which was a party political one. You see the same usage of language, but as to the wider Yorkshire, we'll have to discuss that afterwards, I think. Sorry. So this question is, uh, sorry, just finding it. <laughs> and so this, this question is for both of you. Thank you for the fantastic papers this person says. Um, I wonder if you could say a bit more about how your work is shaped by the surviving sources and what you don't have. Um, what do your administrative and legal sources not give us in your opinion? Um, thank you for a really interesting question. Um, obviously, as I was um, answering Sam earlier, we're sort of, we very often only get one half of the correspondence that's quite helpful to us. So we're sort of very often, you know, there's just this void of response, which would be really helpful um, to know in, in writing um, a thesis on, on, on this subject. But I think um, in terms of my sources in general, um, I look quite a lot at um, petitions, so private petitions, 
And there obviously is this skew in the sources really, because I'm only really seeing when things do go wrong and when things you know, need to be um, corrected by the authorities. So I'm not really necessarily seeing when everything's going quite well. Um, I mean, um, maybe it's my interpretation of Edward II's reign. I'm not necessarily sure there is much evidence of it going well. Um, but even if there were, I probably wouldn't see it in the sources either. So that's, that's one of the great mysteries um, of medieval political history, I suppose. Well, yeah, I mentioned in the paper as well, but um, especially in the Alica cases, it's just one-sided bill of complaints. There's not even depositions or anything like that. So I guess you miss out on things if you're looking for details or kind of what happened. But I think using these sort of sources and trying to kind of read them in depth as opposed to the kind of I don't know, diaries and the usual source you think of the history of emotions and things, it kind of you get to see what was considered plausible in a judicial context to kind of describe motivation and describe action and behavior. So I think you, you do get a kind of a sense of how emotions were seen as related to sort of or how they were played out in social practice, I guess. Um, yeah. Oh, and as well, it's obviously a court case, so it's all, it's all going to be about anger and rage. And so the, the, the lexicon that comes up, you do get a very skewed one. So that, that was Um, it's a question for um, for Rhiannon. Um, but it's a broad question, really, and it sort of follows on from the last question about about what's possible and what's not possible. Um, obviously, this is a, an early career conference focused very much on on new and emerging research agendas. So, in in light of the sources that are available, what would you characterise as being what's happening at the moment, other than your own work? Those kind of new and emerging research questions in terms of the history of, of women, politics, political culture in medieval Britain and Ireland? So in a very broad brush kind of question. That's quite a challenging one, but I'll give it a go. Um, so I suppose there is this emerging idea. Um, I think for the last 20 years or so, we've been thinking about know, knowing that Nat women didn't necessarily have a well-recognized role in politics, where could they find a role? So for example, the work of um, Louise Wilkinson, you may be familiar with, um, has done a lot of work on um, women as sheriffs in the 13th century. And so it's finding ways of attributing um, a political voice to women that perhaps hasn't necessarily been found before. And I think um, the work of my supervisor, Gwen Seaborn, also um, in, in looking at um, Magna Carta and, and statute law and looking at, you know, could this be seen as involving women? Um, even, even though obviously the Latin is very much, you know, liber homo, a free man, would that conventionally be seen as including women by contemporaries? And as I said in my paper, even if it you know, was considered to only talk about men, could it still be used by women in that period to actually assert, assert their rights? So there, there are definitely some you know, new and exciting things going on in women's history. And I hope we see an awful lot more too. Uh, this question is for Jamie. In terms of the language you identified, is that just language picked up in this case, or is this a wider lexicon that appears in other sources? Uh, yes and no. Um, where you first, in the thesis, I've built up a lexicon using dictionaries 
and philosophical texts. So they'd often, it was kind of a blend of Aristotelian, Stoic and Christian views, which I'll just mix together and then usually describe them being kind of basic passions or simple passions, usually lists of like four, six or 11. Um, which then become more complex. So anger would be a basic one, and then it would become wrath, rage, indignation, depending on the different context. So I guess built up the lexicon by you kind of you, you spot the really obvious words like the rage and the fury, and then you kind of see what they're um, used alongside or coupled with. And um, over time, um, I think what you could call the emotional lexicon, although I'm trying not to use a term, as I said. Um, it's all words which either describe morality, character, motivation, action, and then they interact with kind of um, social terms. So things like moderation, prudence are about sort of restraining action or directing it, and civility, which is all about kind of restraint and social propriety. So I think you can build up kind of link of, sort of link of, yeah, emotions and virtues and things that you get kind of to what the how the early moderns saw them, I would say. Anyone else? It's it's another one for Jamie. Um, <laughs> sorry, Jamie. Um, just sort of thinking about emerging disciplines. Um, and I'm just sort of wondering how much, if at all, um, and this is just because of my own interests, um, how much you've thought, sort of thought about all orality um, and language. Um, I was sort of very struck by, in the account, there was loads of sort of, you know, rough talking, I suppose you, you might consider it, and the sort of the bell ringing. Um, how much that relates in the sort of written record to what we know about sort of early modern understandings and fears about noise and um, sort of discord, I guess. And how much emotion plays into that? Um, I guess the language of peace and quiet and things like that. So the peace is a kind of social ideal, which is used in all sorts of, well, it's just an ideal in behavior, feeling, and sort of social peace. So, sorry, uh, <laughs> I have to say all that again. Um, yeah, peace and quiet, the key ideals in all kinds of walks. Uh, all kinds of context, so behavior, feeling, action, social order. So I'd say those references to noise, and you can have like unquiet title as well. And just I guess any reference to that is a kind of would be read in these judicial sources as um, negative. But then Christian Liddy as well has also said that politics, like civic politics, was loud anyway because it was it was all kind of voting by sort of cheers and hands raised and sort of no one really knew who the electorate was so everyone would just gather and make a noise so I, I guess it'll be very easy depending on your uh, purposes to portray that as a riot when it could just be a kind of boisterous election I guess. I don't know if that's answered your question. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I have two questions, one for each of you. Um, so I may start with Rhiannon. Um, and, and thank you both for your papers. Also, I really love the title of your talk. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> really enjoyed the reference. Um, so uh, the answer may well be no, but do we have um, much information about the, um, in particular, the political um, interactions between these sisters? specifically anything they might have, um, I have to say collaborated on, but how they might have interacted with one another politically and managed the, that kind of uh, personal and then political relationships? I mean, it's a difficult one because um, I think a lot of the interactions we do see are more to do with their husbands and the fact that obviously um, Hugh, Dispenser essentially, Hugh Dispenser the Younger essentially just tried to get the full uh, Clare inheritance for himself. And so there's obviously a great deal of hostility between um, Hugh Dispenser, uh, so Eleanor's husband, and then the, the two husbands of um, Margaret and Elizabeth. 
So we can't really know how that would have, unfortunately, we can't really see how, how that would have impacted their relationship. And we can really only see it as a prism through, through these men, as it were. I hope that they tried to help each other because that would be a really nice um, thought, but in the absence of any evidence for it, it doesn't seem to be the case, but hopefully I find, hopefully I find some sort of evidence for that. <laughs> it's always the dream, isn't it, that you oh, find yeah. those. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then for, for Jamie, um, you mentioned about the um, intense uh, emotions being used to discredit somebody. Um, how do you have any evidence in, in your sources of, of that being used after, like outside of the star chamber? Is it brought up again later that somebody has been emotional, uh, has shown intense emotional wants, and so it's more likely that they've done it again and it can be weaponized? Um, um, yeah, um, there's a parliamentary case in Chichester in the 1580s, and um, basically, I guess it's a similar thing. It's kind of kind of raise up the commons and it's all about who the commons are and who can vote and also the, it's the same thing as you used it because I've looked at um, matrimonial cases as well separation cases and it's all about um, yeah the husband's mating um, but it's always described as unreasonable or unmeasured so husbands could have a certain amount of uh, sway in kind of physical correction of the wives and things like that and all the cases kind of they accept that violence is a kind of integral part of like the marriages and things but it's all about whether it's measured so whether it's too intense and at that point it becomes a, a crime and cause for separation but um, yeah that's how it's all framed it's all about moderation as the ideal and uh, as soon as you stray beyond that you kind of not fulfilled your role and then you can break up the marriage thank you um Thank you both for um, two really interesting papers. And um, again, I'm going to be a bit cheeky and pose one question for each, if that's all right. Um, I'll start with Rhiannon. Um, and again, I stress I'm not a medieval specialist, so I may be slightly exposing my ignorance here. But you obviously alluded to the kind of political turmoil and upheaval of Edward II's reign. And I just wondered, you know, to what extent would you characterize the reign of Edward II as kind of an aberration within English politics and um, sort of political stability at that period? Or, or do you see these kind of power struggles as just sort of part and parcel of medieval politics? Well, this is a, a very interesting question. So thank you for posing it. Um, so in the scope of my thesis, I'm actually, my first chapter really compares um, what had gone on in the previous um, half century or so. So I look at um, in the aftermath of the Second Barons' War, so um, after the Battle of Evesham um, and the death of uh, Simon de Montfort. And what we see there is actually, you don't see any women imprisoned like you do um, in Edward II's reign. And there does seem to be this understanding that women should be protected in some way afterwards, because there is this acknowledgement that for most women, they, they probably didn't really agree necessarily with what their husbands were doing. And it wouldn't be fair for them to lose their inheritance or um, their dower, their, their maintenance in widowhood, just because their, their husband had decided to rebel. Um, and we also, you know, I think I've also compared it to um, what happens to um, the Welsh women and um, the Scots women during the wars of independence in the 1270s to 1290s or so. And we do see a similar sort of thing, but it's, it's tricky because we're viewing it um, cross-border warfare is obviously slightly different to civil war. Um, and so I think you've also got to bring in the context of hostage taking, which is pretty common on, on the continent, although less so um, with the taking of female hostages. So in terms of civil war and the context of civil war, I'd say Edward, Edward II's reign is 
pretty rare, um, other than some, some cases you see with um, King John's reign. So to my mind, it's, it is a bit of an aberration, um, but I will be developing that, that slightly more in my thesis as well. Thank you. Um, and then Jamie, slightly cheeky question perhaps, but um, I, I'm just interested in the kind of the, you know, the, the scope of your work more broadly on, you know, the history of emotions. Um, and, you know, we're all really conscious that um, politics, you know, here in Britain lately and indeed around the world has been um, particularly polarized and divisive in recent years. And I just wonder whether you feel there's any lessons that we can draw from your work for contemporary politics and political discourse. That's a cheeky question. Uh, I guess moderation, moderation, moderation. I think. Thank you. <laughs> It's all emotional, but just which emotions and how intense. Um, are there any final questions? Or we've managed to run all the way to the end of this session. We've really grilled the speakers. So if nobody has anything else to ask, I think we'll leave it there for this panel. Um, it just remains to thank our speakers again for two great and really well-connected papers, I think. And uh, we'll reconvene for the next panel at 20 past two. In the meantime, you know, feel free to go out and get lunch. And the exhibition, I believe, is running upstairs on Henry VIII, Defender of the Faith, question um, mark. If anybody would like to go off and have a look at that, we encourage it. So thank you very much. <laughs>